My history with the Jan's world is one of deep adoration, and what some might describe as moral insanity. Yes, reader, I have completely and pitilessly butchered the chronological and publication order of Benedict Patrick's wonderful Jan's world novels. I read the first when I first discovered the author, then followed it with the fourth, which was just about to come out. After that, Benedict asked me to better read for him, and I did that with the fifth Jan's world novel and several other of his projects. The Dark Star series is portal maritime fantasy like you've never seen. Can't recommend it enough. Yet somehow, I utterly disregarded two of his earlier Jan's World books. Those brave, foolish souls in the City of Swords is the one I always knew I'd get to. Something about the title speaks to me. It makes an eloquent promise which Patrick delivers on with a deft swipe of the pen, or several million keystrokes, whichever one seems more likely. I took on the City of Swords in the audiobook format. Derek Perkins does excellent work here. His grave and stately voice as narrator shifts every which way as he breathes life into the myriad characters that populate Patrick's novel. The City of Swords, also known as Espadapan, is home to the Bravadori. Legend portrays them as heroic sword fighters in the vein of Zorro. <laughs> Reality renders them as glorified tugs and bandits. So you tried to get gold out of the country, did you? If you ever again take one peso of mine, I'll cut your throat from here to here. <laughs> Rather than the honourable and noble Queen's protectors, they're supposed to be the Bravadori, are instead violent. If exceptionally skilled, individuals gathered up in stables. Criminal gangs, in truth, battling for supremacy, stopping only short of murder, most of the time. The novel opens with our first protagonist, Arturo, at last arriving in Espadapan to join what he sees as a brotherhood of heroes and defenders of all things good and right in the world. That doesn't go as well as you'd like to think it would. Arturo witnesses a full night's fierce combat between the top stables in Espadapan. The lion's paws and demise, his hope to take part quickly dashed by fear. So begins a long and arduous journey towards realigning the heroes of legend with the flesh and blood people who wear Bravadori masks and wield Bravadori blades. Alongside the many Bravadori who holds bloody battle during Arturo's first night in the City of Swords is Izel. Izel is one of the shaven, combatants infamous for their honorless ways. They were Bravadori too, once, before they committed a crime foul enough that saw them unmasked and trussed out from the life of pampered comfort and luxury the Bravadori lead. The name, as you might assume, comes from the fact that as soon as they lose their honour, they are shaven, their heads, as a sign of their dishonour. Izel's journey is one of redemption and heroism, inspired by the idealism of none other than Arturo. After a fashion, our third protagonist is Crazy Raccoon. This bravador encapsulates the distance between the legend and the reality of Espartapan's blade masters. The man with the fiercest reputation in all the City of Swords, Crazy Raccoon's sterns of fortune, come one after the other, and with breakneck speed. The tree make quite the unlikely bedfellows, and much blood will be spilled before there is an honest reckoning between them. Off on a quest to defend a small village from scores of bandits, Arturo, Izel, and Crazy Raccoon will have to re-examine their biases and deeply held prejudices and get over themselves if they are to survive what's to come. Sword action galore. And if you think 
Bandits are not quite a scary enough threat. Do not fear. The forests and wildernesses of the Yarns world are always full of monsters. There's a path to return to these characters, and I certainly hope Benedict decides to do so. I've grown very fond indeed of Arturo, Izel, and Crazy Raccoon. Each of the three has completed their character arc in ways that refute the societal norms Benedict has created in this particular corner of his Yarns world. Yet each of the three has demons yet unconquered. And the conclusion to this novel certainly shows there is yet more work to be done. Nothing that takes away from the standalone nature of this read, but the possibility of another adventure with this unlikely trio at the centre of it appeals to me. No question about it. As is the way of the Yarns World books, Benedict Patrick tells vignettes from the world, myths, legends, the stories behind the legends. So they start off reading as little more than standalones. These always have a motif that becomes more and more evident the further you read. Sandwiched between each chapter, they give the Yarns World its texture. By the end, these interludes come together into an engaging mosaic that connects to the conflict at the core of the novel. Also, I love this title so much. Ever since I first came across it, some six, seven years ago, I've been riffing on it in D&D sessions, in the shower where no one is supposed to hear, but my nosy neighbour inevitably does. And at one time I was supposed to give a presentation in front of half my ear at uni. It's a problem how deeply embedded this title has become in my mind, is what I'm saying. You'll enjoy this novel if you fancy high-octane sword-fighting action, you have a thing for characters with complex inner lives that clash with the personas they project, you love folklore-based and non-European mythos and cultures, this one is heavily Mexican-inspired. And more, probably. I can't recommend this one enough, folks. It's an absolute delight you'll blaze through if you only take a chance on it. You should. Once you do, come back, let me know which one of the three was your favourite protagonist and why. Also, have you read or are you going to read any more of Benedict Patrick's novels? I've reviewed a good few of them in my day and have added links below if you would consider reading those. I might also do a tier list once I am done with the very final of the Yarns World novels that I have not yet read. It might be a little while though. We'll see. Until then, I'm Philip Magnus. You are not. I'll see you again next time. Bye!